Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to tell you about this podcast. It's called The DK Project, but it's really The Darren Show. The DK Project is a radio show, but without the radio. So sit back, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Let's go! Welcome, podcast listeners, to another episode of The DK Project. Hey, everybody. We have got a special treat for you today. I kind of got a feeling we're going to learn something. Recording in progress. I think we're going to learn something about the PR industry, the music industry, and a whole lot more. Today on the line, zooming in, where are you you calling in from? Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York. Uh, We have Mr. Howard Bloom on the line, and we are going to talk a little bit about his new book and uh, his history here. Oh my gosh, what a lot you got going on! I before we got on, we had just talked about uh, you know the uh, the member of ZZ Top that uh, passed away today, which is a, which is horrible. And you said you actually worked with him, Dusty Hill. Uh, I helped put ZZ Top on the map. I was uh, taken to the office of the mayor of Houston, and the mayor of Houston named me the ambassador of Texas culture to the world which is a little peculiar because the same month I was recruited by the gay community in New York to be their spokesman with their form of music, which was disco. And I'm not gay, and I'm definitely not from Texas. Um, I'm from Buffalo, New York. So give me the, give, give, us, the, give us the background here. Microbiology. Yeah, yeah. Well, I started in microbiology and theoretical physics at the age of 10. Okay. Um, I was a lost child there, and... Um, Nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. The other kids didn't want me playing with them, and my parents didn't seem to have time or interest. Were they Um, they really intelligent people, your parents? My dad founded a tiny little liquor store, and now it is a huge institution in Buffalo, New York. Oh, really? uh, In western New York State. Um, And my mom uh, had a habit of uh, becoming the president of just about any organization she joined. (laughs) So, so they were both both apparently very very competent people. But so I'm sitting there in my family's living room in in Buffalo, New York, one day, and you know how when you're a kid you know the location of every single book your parents own because they've always been on the same bookshelf untouched ever since you came to consciousness. Sure. So all of a, so all of a sudden a book appeared in my lap. I did not know it had never been on the shelves before. And it said the first two rules of science are these, the truth at any price, including the price of your life, and look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and, and then proceed from there. And those two rules, courage uh, about the truth and the, the rule of awe, wonder, and surprise became my religion. And so I got seriously involved in microbiology and theoretical physics. All the because of this of one book? All because of this one book. Well, then I started reading two books a day. Ah, come <laughs> on. Book, no, one book under the school desk. My teachers hated me. I never paid any attention to them whatsoever. And then another book when I got home. Well, it sounds so, like you were smarter than them. Well, uh, by the time I was 12, I was beginning to accumulate minor, modest scientific credentials. I co designed a computer that won some science fair awards. I built my first Boolean algebra machine. I was taken to a meeting with the head of the graduate physics department. I'm 12, Darren. <laughs> Jeez, I'm still, I'm still crapping my pants at 12, and you're changing the world. What the hell? Right. So, this so, isn't fair. And somehow, at the age of 12 or 13, I became fascinated with the ecstatic experience, with the transcendent experience, with that experience of being lifted out of yourself into something much higher than you are. And since I was an atheist, I had discovered that at the age of 12 with science is my religion, who in the world needed uh, God. Um, <laughs> so, uh, plus, when I prayed to God for higher bowling scores, he never delivered. All I got were gutter balls, so so much for that God. Yeah, it's his but, fault. His fault. Uh, so, at any rate, um, I became interested in the ecstatic experience and how it becomes a, a force of history. Um, so, when I got out of NYU, I... Uh, with uh, Phi Beta Kappa, Magna Cum Laude, with fellowships and something didn't have a name yet. Now it's called neuroscience in four different schools. I thought, my God, this is Auschwitz for the mind. I will never get near any of these ecstatic experiences, transcendent experiences that I've been hunting for since I was 12. 
So I took an opportunity to co-found a commercial arts studio, and it became the largest uh, avant-garde commercial arts studio on the East Coast. Um, and I made it on the cover of Art Direction magazine. But that was my periscope position into a culture I knew nothing about, popular culture. Because popular culture was the culture of the kids who used to beat me up or chase me around the block. I was going to say, that's kind of the opposite of where you were at. How, how, how does that come together? How does that happen? Well, it was, a, it was an accident. In my junior year at NYU, um, the poet in residence, who I was busy taking courses from, he thought I'd be the next great poet to come from NYU, um, despite my science fixation, um, said, look, Bloom, when, wait until everybody leaves the room, then close the door. I've got to talk to you about something. And Darren, this did not sound healthy. It did not sound good. <laughs> no. So I, I waited until everybody left. I closed the door. I sat in the bowling out seat and he said, look, you last year I asked you to be on the staff of the literary magazine. You never even showed up. This year, I'm telling you, you are the literary magazine. Oh. You're the editor. Um, you don't even have a faculty advisor. Um, the minute you walk out that door, you're it. Now walk out that door. So I walked out the door looking incredibly perplexed because I hated literary magazines. <laughs> if, if you threw a literary magazine into a room with 36 people having the greatest orgy of their lives, the room would empty in three minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's got that pale blue. Is that how you explained color. it to your teacher? <laughs> well, so I had no choice. I was just it. So a kid walked along the corridor and, and said, you look confused about something. Can I help you? And he took me down for coffee. And because I didn't grow up with other kids, I didn't know what having a cup of coffee was. Um, and he asked me one of the most important questions of my life. If you could do anything you wanted with this literary magazine, what would you do? And I said, I'd make it a picture book. So I turned it into an experimental graphics and literary magazine. Okay. And so now I had a literary team. We won two National Academy of Poets prizes um, with this literary magazine. And I designed this magazine to be unlike anything you'd ever seen before. It was 12 inches by 12 inches and full color. And, um, and I had a team of artists. And um, school ended. I got my Phi, Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude. I was supposed to go to Columbia University in neuroscience. And I walked into the apartment on the Lower East Side of my most brilliant artist. And he, he his wife, and his child were all on a naked wall-to-wall -wall carpet with no furniture crying. And I asked them what they were crying about. And he said, we're about First of all, our electricity is about to be cut off. Our phone is about to be cut off. They've repossessed all of our furniture, and we're about to be evicted from our apartment. And I thought, bloody hell, you're brilliant. If, so I told him, if you just get your portfolio together of your artwork, I will take it out, and um, I will get you work. It'll take me two weeks, and then you can pay your rent, and yeah. everything will be fine. And he insisted that his work be in his portfolio and the work of his best friend, whose work was nauseatingly bad. But, oh, there was a I, kicker. Yeah, I wanted to rescue this guy, for God's sakes. Yeah. And I spent the next three years rescuing him and a team of other artists that eventually coagulated around us and got us little things like I invented a new animation technique for NBC TV. Um, we did all the advertising for ABC's 7 FM stations when they were going through a really radical change from top 40 to this new thing called album radio, progressive radio, where the DJs could play a whole album. Wow. Uh, if they wanted to, where they could play anything they wanted. And we worked for all the major publishers and for a number of magazines and all kinds of stuff. And then we were chosen to art direct this new publication called uh, the National, um, oh God, what was it called? The, Har the National Lampoon. And so- The National we, Lampoon Magazine or the- the magazine, yes. Oh, the nice. Magazine. So My so listeners can understand that. But I regarded this business of being in popular culture, of being in the art studio, as a periscope position. I was after the dark underbelly where new myths and movements are made, and it looked to me like I was going to be able to crawl into that dark underbelly if I followed my nose with this uh, art studio. Nice. And that, and that would bring me to the transcendent and ecstatic experiences that I was after. And sure enough, um, at one point after we got the National Lampoon 
and the artist decided, hey, we're making this gazonkingly huge check every month. Why do we need Howard? Why don't we throw him out and we can take his percentage and divvy it up among us? So Sounds about right. That. Yeah. And but I was I'd been fixated on writing since I was 12. When I was 12, um, I was reading Albert Einstein's book on relativity because a girl in my class had made eye contact with me, which Darren had never happened to me in my life before. Oh, and, and, she, and she told she said, I told my mom that you understand the theory of relativity. And back then, the word was that only seven people in the world understood the theory of relativity. So I jumped on my, my bicycle as soon as school let out. I pedaled over to the library where the librarians literally knew me better than my mother did. Um, I said, <laughs> give, me, give me everything you've got on relativity. And they went rummaging through the shelves and they brought me a great big fat book by Einstein and two collaborators and a little skinny book by Einstein all on his own. So I, and I had learned that if you do things absolutely the hardest way possible, you don't think you're getting anything out of it, but eventually when you come to the end of the project, you learn something. So I was trying to get through this big fat book and eight o'clock at night rolled around. I've been at this for almost four hours. And I suddenly realized my mom's gonna put me to bed at 10 o'clock tonight. If I don't understand the theory of relativity <clears throat> by 10, I will be humiliated tomorrow at school. So I turned to the little skinny book and in the little skinny book, which was written entirely by Albert Einstein, he had an introduction. And in the introduction, tell me if you've ever had this experience. It was as if he grabbed me by the front of my shirt, put his nose up to mine and said, schmuck, listen up. To be a genius, it's not enough to come up with a theory only seven men in the world can understand. To be a genius, you have to be able to come up with that theory, then explain it so clearly that anyone with a high school education and a reasonable degree of intelligence can understand it. So I had my marching orders from Albert Einstein at the age of 12 if you're going to be an original scientific thinker you have to be a writer so when they threw me out of the art studio by then i was on the uh, i was a contributing editor to two magazines an underground fashion magazine called rags and a magazine called natural lifestyles and um somebody saw me at a parapsychology conference you know covering mind readers and spoon vendors and <laughs> people like that yeah um, and he Ooh. walked up to me because he saw a pad in my hand and he saw that i was busy taking notes and everything and said would you like to edit a magazine i mean daryl how Darryl, does this, this stuff just happen yeah um, i can walk around and, all day and nobody will come up to me about anything well and so i well you know i was getting up at six o'clock in the morning in order to write then putting on my clothes at eight o'clock then going into Manhattan for the art studio, then coming home and writing until 11 o'clock at night. And I was getting tired. And I thought, yeah, if I edit a magazine, then I can do my writing during the day. Bingo. Um, yes. So, and I didn't even ask what the magazine was about because in at the uh, end of my freshman year of college, I had looked for a, a writing job for the summer and I found one with the Boy Scouts of America, which was a bit ironic because the Boy Scouts of America had thrown me out when I was 11 years old for incompetence at Morse code. Um, <laughs> but I ended up writing the, uh, the handbook on stalking and tracking, the handbook on camouflage, the Boy Scout handbook, chapter on masturbation, and a book called 10 Steps to Organize a Boy Scout Troop, um, which is you know, the... So you basically Excellent. put together their whole, uh, all their documents that they hand out to all their Boy Scouts, but right. you were not and able to be in the Boy Scouts. Yes, hmm. exactly. Well, you so, probably dodged think, a bullet because the Boy Scouts sometimes make some bad decisions, or the well, troop uh, leaders. They, they made bad ones with me. I mean, I if I was going to teach you stalking and tracking, I wanted you to be able to get so close to a bunny rabbit that it didn't see you until your nose is touched. I was serious about giving my my readers the tools that they needed to do really, really well. So did you figure so it thought, out? Can you do it? Yeah, well, um, the, I've never done it myself. I mean, one day on the way to the Boy Scout headquarters in New Brunswick, New Jersey, I had a commute from New York City. I dropped down on all fours because there was a rabbit in an empty lot, but there were no shrubs, bushes, trees. The <laughs> rabbit was out in the open. You were doing the and, urban rabbit. Yeah, and much as I was crawling on all fours and trying to do stalking and tracking, <laughs> um, the, the rabbit got wind of where I was. So, but the, so I didn't ask what this magazine was about. I just took it for granted 
that it doesn't matter what the subject is. If I love the audience and if I have material with which to do research, I can write about anything. So, so how is it that you don't own a private island and are a gazillionaire at this point? Because you're not well, 12 I, anymore. I didn't care about money. What I cared about was the quest, the quest for knowledge, uh, the quest to find this dark underbelly. And so I was sent off to a meeting at one UN Plaza, which was this very fancy location. Johnny Carson had an apartment there. Who? And Johnny Carson was the biggest thing in television back then. Um, and it was a gorgeous office. I mean, when I walked in, there was a broom closet to my right, and there were two guys in the broom closet packing their things. They had apparently been the editors of the magazine. Whoa. And to my left, there was a uh, an extraordinary office with seven windows overlooking the East River, you could see a, a boat, a ship coming down river from two miles. They north. hired you on the spot. What's that? They hired yeah, you on the spot. Me. The only question the publisher had was, um, he said, "I've got to go to my pop to my printer in two weeks with a finished magazine. Can you give me a finished magazine in two weeks?" And I said, "Yes." I mean, to me, it was obvious I could. I don't know why, Darren. I had the only magazine I'd ever done. Well, this is, it, what is this, late 70s, early 80s, maybe? 1971. 71. So you're typing this on a typewriter and putting yep. a magazine a together. A manual typewriter. Hoosh. A 1940s Remington manual typewriter. <laughs> so, Probably and, worth some money. Words, and, and meantime, when I went to this meeting, we didn't have Google in those days. So you couldn't look up the name of the person you were about to meet with. Ugh. You couldn't find out what he did, what his magazine was. I'd be in a and lot of trouble. He, well, he told me his magazine was circus, and I thought, okay, I don't like clowns and elephants very much, but I can I can write about a magazine for uh, circus people and or circus fans. And he said, no, 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 it's about rock and roll. Yeah. So, so I landed in rock and roll by accident, and then Fleetwood Mac had a concert at Carnegie Hall, and this is before uh, Fleetwood Mac had Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. So it really it was wasn't before. Fleetwood Mac then? Well, that was the real Fleetwood Mac. That was Mick Fleetwood's band. Ah. This was Carnegie Hall. They had the place filled. It was my first rock concert as the editor of a rock magazine. I got a primo seat, and um, we were halfway into the concert, when all of a sudden the, the electricity went off on stage and the electricity went on over the heads of the audience. And you know how you walk into a concert hall, very self-conscious. You want people to see you as being cool. Yeah. So you're very aware of, every, aware of everybody behind you and everybody on either side of you. And then the lights go down on the audience, the lights go up on the stage, and 20 minutes into it, you're totally lost. You, you are no longer conscious of yourself. You're part of a larger whole of some kind. <laughs> so so the, there was no electricity on the stage. Mick Fleetwood came down to the very bottom of the stage. He's this tall six foot four inch string mean of a man and said, we don't give a fuck if there's no electricity. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to rock and roll. Nice. And he galvanized us in the face of a challenge. And I felt that sense of being caught up in something bigger than yourself that I have been looking for since the age of 12. Or to put it differently, I felt I was looking for the gods inside of us since I was 12 years old, and I had found myself by accident into the land where the gods are. So so where do you go from there? Like now you're, I mean, because you go from being probably the biggest nerd in your school to landing one of the probably better jobs in the in the writing world is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, National Magazine. Yeah, Edition. National Music Magazine. You're at, right, you know, you probably got some sweet ass tickets too to these concerts probably. or backstage. Well, I mean, uh, we'll skip the tickets for a minute. My job was to understand rock and roll, which I knew nothing about. So I became like a Talmudic scholar. I mean, during lunch, I brought my brown paper bag lunch into the office. I sat there with New Musical Express and Melody Maker spread out in front of me. Um, my team of writers, I brought in a team of writers. They started to educate me uh, about music. I just was obsessed with music. There was this new thing Sony had just brought out, looked like the headphones on you, except they were these big silver cups with a little black package across the top of your head and giant antennae that reached <laughs> up three feet. So you looked like a Martian. And that gave me an opportunity. It was the first FM stereo radio. 
Wow. And so I bought one of those and I was listening to music constantly. And I studied Casey Kasem's American Top 40 until I could tell you what a song was from the first four notes. Man. Um, and tell you where it peaked on the charts. And after a year, I came, my, my publisher uh, had told me what he wanted to achieve. And I worked on it nights and days and weekends um, for a year. And then I came to him and said, look, um, I'm going to suggest a change in format to you. It breaks every single one of your rules. But I guarantee you that if you let me adopt it, that we will increase in sales. And sure enough, we increased in sales 211% during the next 12 months. Wow. And and I got one day, Chet Flippo, a founding editor at Rolling Stone, um, sent me this big manila folder um, by messenger. And why is, I mean, this is very expensive, sending manila folders <laughs> by messenger. I wondered why in the world Chet was doing it. Well, Chet was trying to legitimate himself in rock and roll journalism. And to do that, he was doing his master's thesis at the University of Texas, long distance. Sure. Um, and it was a history, he was writing a history of rock journalism. So in this manila envelope were six pages about this elf hidden in a converted bloom closet, room closet, who was producing wealth like Rumpelstiltskin spinning <laughs> gold. Um, and it turned out it was me, and he said that I had single-handedly founded a whole new magazine genre the heavy metal magazine. So, wow. so that's how I got into this business. And so my publisher went from living in a modest apartment on Second Avenue and 61st Street to living in a totally immodest apartment the size of an aircraft hangar <laughs> over the East River. Wiser Insurance Agency offering an array of insurance coverages. As a brokerage, they have options like auto owners insurance. Give them a call today, 952-472-3660, or look them up on the web at wiser-ins.com. Hey, everybody. Guess who's hiring? The Hair Studio in Chaska. If you know a professional stylist who's ready to make a move and lives in that Chaska, Southwest Metro area, be sure to give the Hair Studio in Chaska a call, 952-368-0900. They do it all from cut, color, perm, primp, whatever your needs are. Now that the pandemic's over, they're busy. They need to add some more stylists, so give them a call or stop in at the Mill Building, 500 North Pine Street in Chaska, Minnesota, 952-368-0900. The career of your dreams could be waiting just down the road. Be sure to check it out. Great location, great people, great clientele. Tell them you heard about it on the project. Who's the contractor that's called in to fix the less experienced contractor's mistakes? Who's the contractor who gets approval from the insurance company even after the homeowner has been denied? Who's the contractor that has worked in our community and for our community for decades? Grady Restoration. Roofing, siding, windows, and gutters. Call us today for a free home estimate. Grady Restoration. They'll get the job done in a timely fashion. The average roof lasts about 20 years. But you may have storm damage that you can't see, or you may need more repairs than your insurance says they'll pay for. In fact, 92% of homeowners accept what the insurance company tells them, which could cause much bigger problems down the line. Let Grady Restoration help you. Get what you deserve. Call today for a free home inspection for roofing, siding, windows, and gutters. Call Grady Restoration at 952-472-1570 or look them up on the web at gradyrestoration.com. That's incredible. And you and you worked with some of the legends, right? Like Michael Jackson, Billy Joel. Right. Well, that was later. I mean, uh, one day, um, I mean, when I left Circus Magazine, um, I ended up in publicity. And one day I was in my cubicle. I was I had founded the East Coast Public and Artist Relations Department for ABC's um, record com record companies because they had just acquired all of Gulf and Western's 14 record companies. And and Seymour Stein, the, the, the man who founded Sire Records, Seymour is also the guy who discovered Madonna. Seymour, puck, pit, he poked his head into my cubicle and said, if you're so smart, schmuck, if you're so smart, why don't you have your own company? And look, you can challenge me in all kinds of things. I can't catch or throw a baseball. Um, <laughs> I, I can't. Uh, I can't play soccer. I miss the ball every single time. I can't do any normal things. 
But if you challenge me on my smarts, that's the only thing I've got. And you've hit my source. Really? Spot. So, so I ended up founding my own PR company in the music industry. And yes, I worked with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss, Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, David Byrne, um, Joan Jett, Shaka Khan, people like that. Oh my gosh. I, I, Every one of those is in my my playlist, except for Shaka Khan, I think. But uh-huh. I'm aware of Shaka <laughs> Khan. But um, so tell uh, and and Prince lives well lived like two miles from where I am right now. Amazing. And uh, uh, yeah. So so how how was that? I mean, you know, it's so easy when I when I interview somebody and they're like, oh yeah, and then I used to hang out with Prince. But it's like you have so many that like. How do you how do you even know where to start? Like, who was your favorite one to work with? Who was the coolest? My favorite one to work with was Michael Jackson. Remember those first two rules of science: the truth at any price, including the price of your life. Yeah, and things are under your nose before, as if you've never seen them, and then proceed from there. Um, Michael was those two rules in the flesh. Really, he was a living incarnation of those two rules. So I'll tell you two stories that get across an idea of what I'm talking about. I was out at Marlon Jackson's pool house. A pool house is a, a little building just big enough for one reasonably big room on the first floor and another reasonably big room on the second floor. Right. That's it. That's the whole thing. And the first floor room was lined with arcade games. I mean, give me a break. Nobody, nobody mortal can afford an arcade game. Yeah. You have to be Steve Wynn or something like that to have arcade games. So they, they were up against the wall all the way around the room, and then there was a pool table in the middle. And the brothers were extremely good to me, Darren. Um, they crowded around me and put me in the center, and we were looking at tour merchandise, at T-shirts and jackets, and I was trying to explain to them, you try to put on the most spectacular show anyone has ever seen, so you have to have the most spectacular T-shirts and tour jackets. Sure. And, and I knew that there was a meeting coming up with the art director from CBS and Michael was going to be there. So I heard the screen door open. Now, somebody, when I was 19, had taught me a little ritual. Because remember, I didn't grow up with other humans, so I didn't know <laughs> rituals. And it's that if somebody's coming into the room that other people want you to meet, you walk over to that person, you stick out your hand, you say, hi, I'm Howard. And the other person will stick out his hand and say, hi, I'm fill in the blank. Right. Okay. I had, but I had never done it. I had never, ever done it. Now, I'd read stacks of articles this high on Michael Jackson, and every single one of them said he's a bubble baby. He's afraid of other human beings. If you reach out to touch him, he will shrink away in fear. So I heard the screen door opening. I went over to the screen door. I put my hand out to the person who was coming through. I said, hi, my name is Howard. And he stuck out his hand and said, hi, my name is Michael, and shook my hand with a perfectly normal handshake. Um, not a bone-crushing handshake, not a limp handshake, a normal handshake. All right. And I said, I've got a press release that I need your approval on. So I, um, I, where can we do this? Where can I read it to you? And Michael said, let's go upstairs. So we went up to the second story room which was filled to the roof, to the rafters with keyboards and amplifiers. And Michael sat down on one amplifier and I sat down on another amplifier and I started to read this piece. Now remember, I had gotten involved in writing really seriously at the age of 12, really seriously. <laughs> um, I, had, I had art directed and edited a literary magazine that won two National Academy of Poets prizes. I was serious about my writing. I had been getting better and better and better at it for uh, over 12 years now. Well, I read the first two sentences to Michael, and Michael began to slump on his amplifier. He went, oh. And then I read two more sentences, and he slumped even further. He went, oh. And I read him more, and he slumped even further. And he went, oh. And, and when I finished reading the whole thing, he said, man, that's beautiful. Did you write that? Michael Jackson was the only person in my entire career who had seen the art behind the craft. Um, he saw the writing itself in a way that no one, no one had ever I'm seen I'm telling it. you. 
Nothing. So then, nothing's more impressive than good writing. Nothing. Well, then we went downstairs, and um, the art director from CBS was supposed to be there. So she walked in carrying five of the most gorgeous portfolios you've ever seen in your life. And they were hand tooled cherry wood, hand tooled leather, and they were from the giants in the field. Remember, I had gotten into popular culture through an art studio. These were the people who were the legends in that field. Right. I knew the names of all of them. And wow. the art director slid the first portfolio across the green felt of the pool table. Now, Michael is standing at my right side. So his left elbow is against my right elbow. His left hand is up against my right hand. His left shoulder is up against my right shoulder and his left knee is up against my knee. I can feel everything Michael is feeling. And Michael opens the first page of the portfolio, just one square inch, Darren, one square inch, and his knees begin to buckle. Whoa. And he goes, oh, 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 oh. And it's the, so he's conveying all of this because his knees are progressively buckling. His body is conveying all of this to me. And he is seeing the infinite and the tiniest of things. He is seeing more in that first square inch of an illustration than even the artist ever really? saw. It is the most astonishing example of amazement, awe, wonder, and surprise. The first or the second rule of science, look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen it before, then proceed from there, that I ever imagined encountering in my life. An aesthetic orgasm, I'd never seen anything like that. Really? And I've never seen anything like that again in my life. So that was meeting number one. Wow. And then, so I admired the hell out of Michael for that quality of awe and wonder. Now, in my desk on 55th Street near Lexington Avenue was a two-story uh, office with a circular staircase um, connecting the two. So behind my desk, I kept a $19.99 red nylon knapsack. And it was there for a reason. It contained a TRS-100, the first laptop computer, a spare <laughs> shirt, um, and a razor blade because I would get emergency calls to go out to all kinds of places and handle crises. So I'm sitting there at four o'clock in the afternoon at this aircraft hangar sized desk with seven Rolodexes on it. And I got a call from California. You've got to be out here by 11 o'clock tonight. Michael is canceling his tour. You're the only one he will listen to. Uh oh. So, so I flew out to LA and I took my rental car to the address that I've been given and it turned out to be on a studio lot. And a studio lot is an eerie sight at night because there are these big aircraft <laughs> hangar sized buildings and they're all dark and they look like the bones of of dinosaurs. Yeah. But three times the size of a dinosaur. And there was one lit studio. So I walked in and I sat down and the brothers were, were rehearsing on a 110 foot stage. And to give you an idea of what a 110 foot stage is. When ZZ Top had decided to take Texas culture to the world in 1976, they had one of the biggest stages in the world built. It was in the shape of the state of Texas. It was tilted at an angle, so you could see it was built in the shade of, shape of the state of Texas. No matter where you sat, it was 75 feet wide. Wow. The Texas was 110 feet wide. Wow. Um, so um, I waited until they finished their rehearsal. And we all filed out to a dressing trailer. Have you ever seen a dressing trailer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a like a back lot trailer? Yeah, so it's it's this great big van, huge, that's been adapted to be a traveling dressing room. Right. And there were banquettes of red um, uh, plastic seats on this side. There were banquettes on this side of red plastic seats. And then a little banquette by the door. So Michael took the seat by the door because that's the throne. That's the power seat. I took the seat to his immediate left because I wanted him to pay serious attention to me. And Michael explained, first of all, the tour had been getting extremely negative publicity before I was hired. And the Now, this is was, Michael Jackson alone, not the five. This is just... No, this is all of them. This oh, is it is? The, the Jacksons were all getting together as a family in something like three years. Okay. Since Michael had become the most, well, Michael had become the biggest thing in show business. Yeah. He had become as big as Elvis Presley and the Beatles combined. 
Yeah. And um, so the tour, there was a guy named Dave Marsh. Now, in the in the press, there are certain lead sheets. And what they say, everybody else in the press is going to repeat. And one of these lead sheep was Dave Marsh. And Dave Marsh said, we know everybody in the business. We meaning the rock crit elite, they called themselves. Um, and we know all the best sound guys, all the best lighting guys, all the best staging guys, all the best security guys. And no one we know has been hired to build the stage. So the stage is going to collapse. It's going to be amateur under the feet of the performers. No one we know has been hired to do the sound. So the musicians are going to be electrocuted on stage. <laughs> Nobody we know has been hired to do the lighting. So these giant lighting towers, six stories tall, are going to fall on the heads of the audience and kill people. And nobody we know has been hired to do security. So there are going to be gangs running up and down the aisles, eviscerating kids. So you don't dare take your kids to this concert. That had been the word before, wow. before I ever it was pre Howard. That. Yeah, to the Jacksons. And now, all of a sudden, Michael, sitting there next to me with his right knee, his left knee up against my right knee, explained to me how, why this had been possible, this negative press. Because Michael, a year earlier, had scattered out the best staging, lighting, um, and security people, and the best magicians. And he had put them to work on this tour. And because Michael has a quality of awe, wonder, and surprise that is utterly beyond belief, he feels he has that as a gift from God. And that means it's his job to give that kind of awe, wonder, and surprise to his kids, to his audience. Um, and he's only going to be able to do that if the tour is a surprise. That is, if the stage show is an utter and complete surprise. So when he signed the best people in the business to work with him on the tour, he signed them all to NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. Yeah. He signed them all to absolute secrecy. Why? So that when the tour first hit the road, kids would be awed. And Makes Michael, sense. Now, three weeks earlier, I, I was working three days a week wherever the Jacksons were and four days a work week in my office in New York. And um, three weeks earlier, I'd gone out to L.A. to run a press conference with the medical people from a major hospital because Jackie, Michael's brother, had come down with a bone chip in his knee and had just undergone arthroscopic surgery. So I'm sitting there, catty corner to Michael in this dressing trailer. And Michael explains, my brother Jackie is the best dancer and choreographer I've ever seen. Now, think about that for a minute, yeah. Aaron. Michael was probably the most extraordinary student of dance yeah. in the 20th century. He studied everybody from James Brown to Fred Astaire. So if he says his brother Jackie is the most astonishing dancer and choreographer he's ever seen, that is an expert judgment. For and sure. He said, he said, I need to tip, have, make sure my brother Jackie can be there with us when we perform because I've got to awe my audience. Um, and Jackie's the uh, surgery in Jackie's knee is not healing as quickly as we'd like. Um, now, while he's saying this to me, I have the only visual vision in my life. I've had a bunch of visions about people who could or should be superstars, uh, a small, small handful of them. But in this case, it's my only visual vision. And I saw Michael's ribs as golden gates. And I saw those ribs open. And I saw 10,000 kids inside of Michael. And those were the 10,000 kids Michael was absolutely committed to awing. Were you doing any drugs at that time? No, not at all. I don't <laughs> do drugs. I don't even drink coffee. So, <laughs> so, so how did you talk him into going back out? How did you? I explained the horrible press that the crew had been getting and that if he postponed, um, it was going to validate all of the accusations That's of true. amateurism and that if those claims of amateurism were validated, none of Michael's kids would be allowed to see his concerts. So, but there's a strange thing, Darren. Sometimes when you know a truth, it comes out of you as if you were a prophet summoning or the power of God had seized you and spoken through you. And Michael had that ability because his 
his clarity about his truth was so profound. He had that prophetic power. But I apparently have it sometimes, too. Wow. So Michael decided not to cancel his tour. I knew exactly what would happen if he canceled. It would have been Armageddon for the Jacksons. Wow. How long were you with him? I was not with Michael that long. I was with him for uh, about a year because eventually the people who were, Michael represented more power and more money than anyone had seen in our lifetimes at that point. What do you mean by that? Just because of who he was? Because he'd sold 36 million records. The previous record holder had sold 11 million. (laughs) That was Peter Frampton. Um, because he was bigger, as I said, than the Beatles and Elvis Presley combined. Um, and so there were people circling around Michael who wanted that power. And those were the people who had said, call Howard. He's the only one Michael will listen to. Wow. But because I was the only one Michael will listen to, and because I was trying to track down who had been sabotaging this tour, I became a danger um, to, the, to the major shark circling Michael. So it was very, very hard to alienate me from Michael. I mean, one day, the Jacksons were all meeting at a boardroom at CBS. Now, I had never heard of CBS ever opening a boardroom to one of its artists to take over (laughs) before. It was unheard of. And apparently, somebody walked into the room and said, you see all this press that Prince is getting? Well, that's Howard Bloom. Howard is a spy. He's a plant from the Prince camp um, to destroy you. (laughs) So that's the kind of crazy stuff um, that was being used to alienate me from Michael. Well, I got to think that a lot of that, you know, and I've talked about it before on the show, a lot of that, those kind of people like Michael or or Prince or anybody at that level, they just have people around them who, you know, don't want, don't want anything to go bad or whatever, but they'll tell them what they want to hear. And it's not real. You know, it's not a reality thing because it's not the real world. It's very, I used to lecture poor John Mellencamp about the fact that he would reach a certain point where he could surround himself with yes men. But yes men was not what he needed. He needed somebody around him who would bring him face to face with reality. And I I just had, uh, I just had Kenny Aronoff on, on Monday. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, wow. What a, what a guy that is. Oh, oh he's my. Amazing. His, he, yeah. It was a great, great, it was a great interview. And, uh, but he spoke very highly of John and, uh, and his technique in, in, you know, delegating and, and managing the team. I, I, I thought it was kind of interesting to hear because I've always been a Mellencamp fan, but to hear the inner workings like that, you know, and then, and then to hear you say that, that like, you know, these guys, I don't know. It's, it's a different world. Yeah, it's a very different world, and I tried to be the voice of truth because that's what I felt. If you hired me, you'd hired me for, um, was to bring you face to face. Yeah, yeah, with the difficult truths. So then, so, so then you were with Prince, and and Michael went by the wayside. Not no, not really. Michael did go by the wayside, but the Prince thing. I'd been with Prince since 1981, and the Jacksons was 1983. But I'm going to say something incredibly narcissistic and egotistical. All right. Um, I watched the people around uh, Michael Jackson, even in the years I I left the music industry in 1988 and went back to my science. Um, I became sick and was in bed for 15 years. And from that distance, I was watching what was happening with Michael. And I had this feeling that though he's tried to surround himself with brilliant people, um, like David Geffen, for example, um, that I was the only one who understood Michael. And once I wrote this book, this book, Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll, one of its purposes is to put you next to Michael Jackson, put you in his presence, so you would feel the awe and wonder of who he was. Why? In 1954, the best sports physiologists in the world all agreed, no human could possibly break the four-minute mile. And then a med student and a med student friend of his, the med student was... Uh, studied the way the med student ran. His name was Roger Bannister. And they eliminated every energy-wasting move that Roger Bannister made when he was running. (laughs) And Roger Bannister did the physiologically impossible. He ran the four-minute mile. But when he did that, he expanded the envelope of human possibility. So since then, every major international competitive runner breaks the four-minute mile. 
1,800 people have broken the four-minute mile. Well, what Roger Bannister was to the four-minute mile, Michael J Jackson was to awe, wonder, surprise, and a sense of connection to the truths inside of you. So I'm trying to get that across in this book so that Michael can do what he, I, I'm going to use a weird phrase, what he was meant to do. And that is so he can expand the boundaries of your own perceptions. So he can expand the boundaries of your own awe, wonder, surprise, and commitment. See, and I, I, I don't, I never saw Michael in concert, but I did see Prince in concert. And I never met Prince, but, I, you know, my kids, I've got, you know, 15, 19, 20, and a 30. And my only thing is I wish they could have seen Prince before he passed. That that was amazement and wonder to me. That guy on stage was – that blew me away. And I, I I couldn't imagine what Michael Jackson was like. And, and, you know, I mean, I go to see the whatever Circus Olay show of Michael Jackson in, in Vegas and I'm blown away. I can't imagine what a real Michael Jackson show would have been like. It um, was astonishing. Um and, but it was so different. I mean, the, the best performers that I worked with were um, John Mellencamp, Prince, um, Joan Jett, and Billy Idol. And these people lived for the stage. And so did Michael. Um, but Michael was different. No two John Mellencamp concerts or Prince concerts were the same. Um, these guys were seized by the force of inspiration and did different things every single night. Michael Jackson had every step and every hand movement choreographed. Really? So if you watched 58 of his two concert performances, which I did, um, every night was exactly the same. But John Perellis in the New York Times put his finger on what was so astonishing about this. Um, Perellis said that Michael was as good as, if not better, than his videos or than his studio performances. That is impossible for a musician to be as good or better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The stuff that yeah there's a lot through. going on in the studio that you don't see yeah, when they're live, right. for sure. So, Mike, so Michael was flat out astonishing. Plus, Michael had invented something. In the days of Fred Astaire, um, tap dancing was something that had come from the streets of Harlem. And it was a black folk thing. And when the first tap dancers were allowed into movies in the 1930s, they sort of had to apologize for being black and being in a movie because movies were the province of white people. So even though they did astonishing things with their feet, they kept their hands like this, limp. And basically, those limp hands were there to say, I am not a threat to you. Huh. They're, they're what's called in science a submission gesture. Okay. Um, so when Fred Astaire studied the black originators of tap dance in order to become one of the world's best tap dancers, he didn't think of what his hands were doing. And his hands did exactly this, the same wow. thing, they angled down, which made him a very unconvincing suitor for Ginger Rogers. <laughs> sure. Um, so nonetheless, his movies went over great, and, but Michael invented a whole new use for your hands. Instead of dangling there uselessly, he pointed. Yeah. He pointed at the stage. He pointed at the sky. Um, he pointed all over the place. And that was a movement of mastery. That was a dominance gesture, the very opposite of a submission gesture. And Michael gave you a feeling of being empowered. So did this happen uh, by did this happen by chance, or is he was he just brilliant and, and knew these things, but we as the audience were too blind to see it or, or weren't aware of it was he was he that brilliant or was it it was it just something that uh coincidentally he was doing this no i think it was utter brilliance i think he realized that you can't just do dancing from the navel on down from the belly button on down right you have to do it with all of your body if you're going to give your audience a sense of empowerment and that's what michael offered to his audience uh, I mean, wow. he offered them supreme entertainment, but he offered them a sense of empowerment. And you'd come off stage, and Michael would have done an absolutely perfect performance, and all Michael could think of was all the little things he had slipped up on. Yeah. Not that nobody saw those right. slip up, but Michael. But that quality of perfectionism 
was extremely important to making Michael who he was, but really it was the force of God within him. Remember, I'm an atheist, but we're speaking <laughs> metaphorically. It was the gods inside of him. Well, and I think, over. you know, he's the closest thing I've seen to a Beatles reaction. I know when I was younger and he was going to be on the Grammys or whatever, whatever it was going to be, it was like, it was like the biggest thing ever. He was, he was probably the hottest celebrity for what? I don't know, five, seven, ten years where he was like it. There was no other option. And, and just for him to show up at one of these award shows meant, you know, the, the viewers would, would multiply dramatically because he was such a big deal, and and I don't know, has there been anybody like that since? I don't, I don't think there has. No, I mean, there, there hasn't, and 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 there hasn't been anybody doing what I used to do in the music industry. If you came to me as a potential client, I gave you a little speech, and I said, if you expect me to fashion an artificial mask for you, an image, and sit back here like a guy in a plaid suit with a cigar, and say, kid, with this image, I'm going to make you a star. Then I'm going to send you to my best competitor. That's what they do. That's not what I do. If you're going to work with me, you have to understand that music is not about an exchange of pieces of plastic. It is not about an exchange of money. It is not about an exchange of downloads. It is about an exchange of human soul. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I, I think, you know, obviously uh, a lot of times that's reflected by the number of transactions, you know, by downloads and by sales and whatnot. But you don't get there by not having the connection, the depth, you know, that you, that you're talking about, and 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 it, it, it always baffles me. Like I'll uh, be somewhere and someone will be listening to I don't know some heavy metal, whatever. Just and it's like, what is going on? But they have a connection there. But if you can have that connection with the masses, that that's what creates a superstar. But you yeah. know, you know how so many. I, so there, I had these 15 years in bed. Miserable, horrible. Yeah, what the, what the hell was that? I saw that online. You were, uh, oof. Well, uh, nobody knew. My doctor didn't know. Um, I went to a doctor who said it was some crazy disease that toy off in left field someplace just to uh, placate me or something. So nobody what, knew. You couldn't get up? You couldn't, like, just be hugely depressed? Or what was the deal? I, I couldn't. I could walk to my bathroom, and that was as far as I could go. My kitchen is only a dozen steps away from my bedroom. I couldn't get there. Um, my hands sometimes were too weak to lift. So there were days when I couldn't even do so anything on people. You went from you went from running this PR firm to down for 15 years. Right. And during those 15 years, I wrote three books, and I founded two international scientific groups, thanks to the Internet. So even when you're sitting people. around, you're doing more than I am. <laughs> yeah. So, but when I got out of bed in 2003, I was convinced that nobody remembered the artists that I worked with anymore, that the time for those artists had passed. And I was particularly concerned about what had happened with Michael Jackson because of all the sexual scandals. Um, it, look, Michael Jackson was on this planet for 50 years. For 25 of those years, he was becoming Michael Jackson. And for 25, he was dangling on the cross, thanks to the sexual accusations. Right. So I walked into a local cafe called the Tea Lounge and started to talk to people, wondering what response I would get to Michael Jackson and Prince. People were galvanized, absolutely galvanized, because these two people, Michael Jackson and Prince, had formed some vital backbone of their emotional lives, and they were never going to let go of Michael Jackson or Prince, no matter how many sexual accusations there might have been against Michael. In their heart, they knew those sexual accusations were irrelevant and wrong. Well, there's a lot of people that get hung up on that. There's a lot of people that won't listen to Michael Jackson or won't do whatever because of that stuff. And and I don't know. I, I, will we ever know? I mean, it's, it's scary. Well, I told it's a, scary. I told, I told a story in the book. One day, Billy Joel, one of my clients, was motorcycling out on Long <laughs> so Island. So calm. One day, Billy Joel, one of my clients. <laughs> and, uh, and the light ahead of him at an intersection was green. And do you go through a green light or do you stop at a green light? You go? You go yeah, you go. So he went, and it turns out there was a car that had a red light at right angles to him. And it didn't stop. 
It just went through the intersection and was turning left. So Billy slammed on his brakes, and it wasn't enough. He was too close. Mm. Um, so the motorcycle hit the car, and he went flying over the roof of the car and landed on the other side. A 27-year-old woman who was driving the car was hysterical. She was sure she had killed this anonymous Oof. man. And she rushed over to see if she could help him. And then uh, Billy was medevaced to Lenox Hill Hospital, and they worked like crazy to save his right hand. Because if Billy Joel had lost his right hand, um, it's catastrophic. he's a yeah. He comes alive on stage. That's where his real life is. Um, and oh. it would have deprived all of us of, of Billy Joel. So at any rate, meantime, the, the woman driving the car must have gone to an attorney. And the attorney must have said something like this. Look, you've just hit the jackpot. That guy who flipped over your car and landed on the oh. other side wasn't just anybody. He was a superstar. And so you can threaten to take him to court, which will threaten him with negative headlines. And because he has to stay out of negative headlines, he will pay you off. Oh. And sure enough, Billy Joel paid her off $250,000, which was a lot of money in those days. Ah. And so imagine you're a single mother. You have no means of a regular livelihood. Your husband hasn't been keeping up with his child support. And Michael Jackson has become friends with your kid. And because for kids, sleepovers are the biggest thing around. I mean, remember your first oh, sleepover? Sure. You babbled until 6 o'clock in the morning when the sun came up. Right. You just couldn't stop talking. So, and Michael, Michael's bedroom is not a private place. It was a public place. For example, when Michael was supposed to write We Are the World, the lyrics with Lionel Richie, another client of mine, the two of them went to Michael's bedroom and lay on the floor um, and they were busy swapping lyrics back and forth and all of a sudden Lionel felt these eyes locking onto his eyes at the height of his head a foot and a half off the floor uh -oh. um, so he very slowly turned around and discovered um, Michael's pet boa constrictor ah. muscle, sizing him up for lunch so Michael's bedroom was a public place not a private place so you're a single mother. You're having trouble making ends meet. Michael is having your kid over for sleepovers. Um, a lawyer says to you, hey, you know, if you accuse him of sexual improprieties with your child, he's going to have to buy you off. And, and Michael did. The first uh, payment was $25 million, if I've got it correct, to yeah. the first one to make this accusation. And once an accusation has been introduced, other people, seeing how successful it is, repeat it. They imitate it. Well, oh, for sure. For sure. That's the world we live in. It's just yeah. gross. So we will never know what Michael's sexual proclivities were. But I personally seriously doubt that there was any sexuality going on with these kids. But I will never know. Yeah, we'll never know. I, You know, it's it's interesting uh, uh, how how that whole thing played out. And, and on the same note, it's interesting how... The Prince situation has uh, progressed since his death, and all of his newfound family members. It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> his newfound family. You know, it's the same that. thing where none of the there's no will, so now everybody's a relative. Everybody's got their hands in everything, and they're just you know releasing all these albums that obviously he didn't want out, releasing songs he didn't want out, and and it's just kind of you know greed and and money and 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 it just changes people and it's just disgusting what's happening to you know people like michael jackson or, or prince or you know the list is long um where it's just greed people people are in it for the money i want the money you know sue okay. sue sue something really ghastly happened a year after michael died um the people handling michael's estate had a press conference and they pointed out in that press conference that since Michael's death, they had doubled the value of his estate. Now think of this. They weren't mourning for Michael. Not a one bit. No. They were gloating over making money off of even Michael's death. It was disgusting, Darren. It was disgusting. It's horrible. It's horrible. I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it's, yeah, well, we could talk about Michael all day. Let's talk about your book. So we're going to learn about Michael and what it was like to be next to Michael in this book? Yes, you're going to feel it viscerally as if it happened to you. 
at least that's my hope. I do my best with my writing to bring you into the scene. Because you've got a and bunch of books out, right? It. Uh, it's my seventh book, and I'm working on my eighth book now. Wow! So, wow! I mean, so what made you de- what made you finally decide to write this one, Einstein, well, Michael Jackson, middle, and me? I was in the middle of another book. And I was out in uh, L.A. and took my friend Eric Gardner to Mel's Diner um, so he could eat lunch and I could sit there and talk. And um, (laughs) I was telling Eric a whole bunch of stories. Now, my assumption had been since Eric and I had been close in my days in the music industry, he knew all these stories of the things that had happened with me and my clients. And it turned out he didn't know any of them. And his jaw was dropping. And he said, you have to write this in a book well my credentials when i in 1988 when i got sick re-establishing my scientific credentials was extremely difficult because who's going to take seriously a science person who's been involved with michael jackson prince bob marley etc no one um but by the time eric gardner said this at mel's diner i had um either published in peer-reviewed journals or given lectures at scholarly conferences in 12 different scientific fields. Man. From quantum physics and cosmology to evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, information science, and aerospace. So I felt my scientific credentials were well enough established <laughs> that I could afford to write this book. And I realized from what Eric was saying that these memories would not last forever um that i was going to have to get them down on paper or whatever we use these days on a computer screen for sure or they drifted out of my mind wow so i I set aside everything that i was doing i set aside the book that i was writing um and went directly to einstein michael jackson and me a search for soul and the power of its rock and roll and think of it when I gave you that lecture about music and is, is an exchange of human soul, yeah. what I told you was when you are sitting in front of a blank screen at two o'clock in the afternoon and you have to write a lyric because you've got an album deadline coming up, you know da- damn well you cannot write a lyric. You wonder how yeah. you've ever written a lyric in the past. Right. When, on a reasonably good day by four o'clock in the afternoon, there's a lyric in front of you. And on an unreasonably good day, maybe once or twice in your lifetime, that lyric is so perfect, it feels like it wrote itself through you. Well, my job is to find the gods inside of you that wrote those lyrics. When you go on stage on on a really good night and you see the pupils of the audience dilating, their eyes widening, and you see their faces melting, and you see them melting into one big amoebic blob of a common energy, and you see that common energy stretching a pseudopod out to you like a tunnel and sending the energy of that audience through you, and you have an out-of-body experience, you're watching all of this from the ceiling, and you see that energy come up to somewhere around your head and be utterly transmogrified and flow back down to the audience again in a reverberatory loop, a continuous feedback loop. My job is to find the gods inside of you who danced you like a puppet on stage Are they, is that do you find do you find that and i have i haven't met a lot of uh you know top level musicians do you find that they're just a little different than everybody else and i don't mean like you know i just mean like uh because be, being on stage and doing what you're talking about and, and entertaining to that level and you know someone like michael jackson or or zz top or billy joel were you doing it night in night out night in night, are they just made for that i mean is that just a different kind of person where it's a different kind of person because they eat breathe and sleep music that's it they absolutely have to make music the reason there is all that music in the vaults for prince is that he was compulsive music maker he had to make music every day that's where he came alive and yet we live in a world where you can put out one album initially two albums a year then later only one album a year then later only one album every two years so that's why in my opinion that's why prince developed so many proteges and had me train them all in how to work with the press because he was he was a compulsive music maker and he put out more of his music through morris day in the time for example or through vanity six oh yeah uh, as another example so there's all this music in the vaults 
And none of us, some of us reach a very high quality periodically and then put out a lot of stuff that isn't up to that quality. Oh, yeah. But to maintain that level... That's where you get your superstars. I mean, that's right, exactly. That's not easy to do. I mean, we do it every time here on the DK project. I mean, every show is, you know, top of the food chain. But right. not all not all podcasters are that way, and I know that. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so we're getting stuff that Prince wouldn't have wanted to release. It takes a really talented person to run the estate of a star. For example, um, I was talking to Priscilla Presley. Sure. One day. And her common law husband had set me up for this meeting with her. And he had explained that when Elvis died, his father looked over the situation, saw that um, that the estate owed a ton of money in taxes. And the father and the local bank were about to liquidate. They were about to get rid of Gracie Mansion in order to pay the back taxes. Priscilla Presley was on a plane. She used her phone on the plane to talk to the bankers and to the father. And she said, just give me a year and I will turn this around. Really? Um, and she did. She made Graceland into a tourist attraction. Basically, she saved it. So every estate needs a Priscilla Presley, not a bunch of ghouls and vampires who are going to brag that they've doubled the value of the estate, not caring about Michael's death at all. It needs talented people who really believe in what's there. Well, and I think, I, I, you know, there's a lot of those stories, and the Prince one is like a kind of an ugly one. Like it, 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 it really, uh, how that whole thing went down. And I guess my biggest thing is if you were involved with him and you and you knew of him, how 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 does it get to be where he doesn't have a will? Like how how does he, how do you get to that level with that amount of assets and you don't have a will? Well, you take it for granted you're going to live forever. I mean, we all know the basic rule: everybody else is going to die, but I'm going to live forever. Well, <laughs> yeah, but how 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 do even the people around him, who may have some interest or or something to gain by him having a you know having him, uh having a will? Like I, I just can't I can't get my head around that. Well, because Prince was so huge, look, he was going through a major transition. And in 1987, he got rid of his manager, Bob Cavallo, who's a fucking brilliant man, just an astonishingly brilliant man. And he got rid of me. He got rid, you, you put your finger on it before, he got rid of the people who would tell him the truth so he could surround himself with yes men. So he no longer had somebody who could make a point, <coughs> point out of getting a will out of him well but even 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 the drugs like you know that shit's going to kill him why why would they keep getting him for him um but but the the story is that he had really serious back problems and uh i can understand that kind of pain i mean look i was locked in a bedroom for 15 years you these things happen to you that you have no no choice over. sure sure and you'll you'll take that the the horrible thing was there is an antidote to fentanyl. It's naloxone. And the, now they're moving for every drug user to have naloxone wherever he goes so that if he begins to feel an overdose coming on, he can just pop the naloxone. A, a simple pill of naloxone would have saved Prince's life. That's incredible. Did, did we not know about it? Was it like, how does that happen? How do we not we, have we it? We knew about it, but we weren't doing anything about it. I mean, there was a movie called, um, oh God, I forget what it's called. Uh, it's about the drug wars and how the drug wars have been destroying America, the war on drugs. Okay. Um, I'm in it. The Culture High, that's what it's called. <laughs> I'm in it. Listen to you. Right. Just a name dropping, uh, mention kind of guy. I'm in it. Right. You know, my so, client Lionel Richie. But it, it shows you how the war on drugs has done enormous damage um, to the United States of America. Um, right now, we have more important stuff to crack. We're 40 or 50 years behind on our infrastructure. Yeah. Um, among other things, the Chinese can run rings around us because they have a 21st century infrastructure. We have a 20th century infrastructure. Um, you know, we are dominated by potholes right now, not high speed trains. Yeah. Um, the Chinese have more trackage for high speed trains than any other country in the world. I, I think I think it's. Uh... 
I think it's a, uh, uh, well, <laughs> we'll see. I, I don't even want to get into politics. That's just a slippery, bad slope to go down. No, um, hey, we got to wrap this thing up, man. It, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. You are a wealth of knowledge and information. We're going to get everybody out to buy your book, Einstein, <laughs> Michael Jackson, and Me. Right. I, I. What was the other book you were working on? Oh, I'm working on it. It won't be out for three years. It's called The Case of the Sexual Cosmos, Everything You Know About Nature is Wrong. Oh, well. <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> so, so uh, that, that, but but if you get to read, but by all means, read Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me. Let me know what you think about it. Yeah, well, I was going to ask, is there an audio version? That's... I'm not sure. Um, I, I know there are audio versions on my first two books, The Lucifer Principle and Global Brain, and I'm not sure whether there is an audio version on the new book. Well, I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy. That's cool. <laughs> Well, listen, uh, Howard, uh, we can't thank you enough for all the time. Uh, everyone, get out there and get that book. It's available on Amazon. It looks like it's everywhere, so you're going to find it. Google Howard Bloom online and check out the stories. There's videos. We didn't even get into the uh, uh, the grand unified theory. That right, seems, which that, is a big deal. That seems like a big deal. Right. Give me, give me the, the give me the, the five minute overview on it. Well, the, there's a movie called The Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom. It's a 66-minute documentary. It's won two festival awards so far. But The Grand Unified Theory is something I've been working on since I was 12 years old. That's a long time. Wow. And it's effort to see the underlying patterns in the cosmos and how this cosmos does what, what she does. This cosmos is an astonishing innovator, an astonishing inventor. And it's about this com this com this this cosmos as an invention engine, as a transcendence engine, as as a cosmos that's constantly trying to to outdo herself. That's constantly trying to do things so utterly and inconceivably new that it makes your jaw drop, and is constantly trying to break her own rules. Really, uh, and and triumph over them. And so that's what the, uh, the is, case is that a, a self-published documentary or did they do that oh, on you? What yeah, happened? The, the documentary is not self-published. It's from three time Emmy winner, Charlie Hoxie. It was produced by brick TV, which is a Brooklyn based, um, TV channel among other things. Sure. And so that's out there. And if you take a look at it, let me know. Yeah. People can find it. It's on YouTube, right? It's uh, on YouTube. It's I don't know if it's on YouTube, but it's on Amazon. It's on Apple. It's on everything with the exception of Netflix. All right. All right. And if people want to get a hold of you, Howard, how do they do it? They go through the website? Are you on social media? What are we talking about? Um, well, they go to howardbloom.net. Um, and my personal email is howl, H-O-W-L, like wolves howling at the moon, bloom, B-L-O-O-M, at AOL.com. Aha, uh -huh, one of those lifelong AOL guys. Yes, exactly. I like it. Well, everyone, tune in to uh, Howard's stuff. Get out there and check it out, and uh, we'll check in with you somewhere down the line, sir. That thank you so much for the good. time. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. That's it. That's the end. That's a wrap. Read the shtick. That's a wrap for today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and tell all your friends. If you'd like to reach out, you can use the studio line at 612-504-6500 or by email, the DK Project Podcast at gmail.com. And of course, there's always social media at the DK Project Podcast. Thanks for tuning in.